Uh, good afternoon. It's uh, 4.33 p.m. Uh, on January 22nd, uh, 2016. Uh, this is not really a Wujo per se. This is going to be um, the first in um, uh, a series of videos that we're going to call Half Past Human Discovery Videos. I'm going to do a tell and show here. I'm going to tell you briefly about what's going on at Half Past Human and then uh, describe some of the things that are occurring in the broader world. And then I'm going to do a quick um, science demo by way of um, our, our show component. And so, uh, new here at Half Past Human, we finally have found some property, uh, making an offer on it. Uh, assuming that Universe supports it, we'll be in sometime, you know, who knows how long, but uh, sometime this year. And we'll be able to continue with uh, these sorts of uh, discovery videos as we pursue our new work. Uh, our new work is going to be in the field of what uh, had been described in the reports as the new electrics. Uh, I've been doing uh, software for, geez, ever since, uh, probably ever since software came around. I've been uh, tinkering with code since 79 in one form or another, 1979. Uh, so I'm actually kind of tired of software, uh, and I'm going to start doing hardware stuff. Uh, I don't know if that's good or <laughs> good or bad, but I'm interested in doing some hardware stuff, so I'm going to move into the new electrics. And, and also I'm able to do some fundamental research where other people are going to be involved in trying to do rapid prototype and development because the field of the new electrics is really taking off. Uh, I find it an analogous to uh, the invention of the automobile uh, and its perfection around the northern hemisphere. Uh, in the late 1800s, which was a, a grassroots movement that was was juxtaposed or counter counter uh, positioned to the uh, corporate entities of the time, putting their money into trains and very large forms of transportation. So automobiles arose uh, as a grassroots expression from universe, if you will. And we're seeing that same kind of thing now, uh, again, mostly in the northern hemisphere, insofar as I am aware. Uh, in the field of the new electrics. And the new electrics can be characterized as uh, a new understanding uh, that leads to a radically uh, different engineering um, uh, technologies and engineering fundamentals for electricity and other kinds of associated phenomena. Uh, the uh, reason I say this latter will be evident as we go along. So, um, uh, in our work, we're going to be doing here at Half Past Human, if we can get this uh, new place, if Universe cooperates with us and uh, provides the support, which it seems to be doing at this point, uh, we will have the facility to set up a number of uh, laboratories with um, camera stations where applicable and uh, use those to demo the stuff as we go along. I'm going to be looking at some of the fundamental principles because while others are using some of the new electric um, uh, technologies in a search for free energy. That's not really my goal. My goal is a uh, uh, different. I'm gonna. Uh, uh, my, my goal is sort of like um, um, I, I want to invent uh, the floating uh, recreational vehicle and the hoverboard, that kind of thing. Uh, and and I think it's achievable uh, in a now that especially now that we're getting some of the results that we're getting. Uh, with this new view of things. And so, uh, also analogous to the late 1880s, there's a, um, uh, a coalescence of the official view of the planet uh, and reality in a scientific sense that is centering around uh, quantum physics and leads us to CERN, these giant, huge uh, fake hunts for uh, little tiny particles. Uh, CERN is all about uh, time travel, in case you haven't tumbled to that. The manipulation of time and uh, broader field energies. And that's actually what's happening. And they don't recognize it, I think. Or maybe they do recognize it. I, I don't know. I, I'm not tied into the inner circles of any of the powers that be. But uh, they don't appear to recognize that the uh, whole uh, engineering of a uh, greater field, um, of, or the whole field of field engineering in a greater sense, the whole arena of being able to engineer fields, gravity, uh, electricity, um, magnetism, all of these, they're just basically fields in what we must consider uh, to be the ether, the way it was described in the late 1800s, uh, in which they're trying to re-describe as dark matter with their um, with the quantum approach to things, which is entirely wrong in my opinion. You, you can't I don't think they'll progress very far. And in the meantime, I think people will be making practical discoveries in their mother's attics and in their garages and this kind of thing that will outstrip anything that comes out of the 
uh, officialdom by way of CERN and academia and so on. Now, uh, if you're not into, if you're not a maker, if you don't go out and build things just uh, basically for the hell of it, because universe forces you to, you're probably not aware of things like uh, the uh, huge number of people that are experimenting with rodent coils, uh, which are a specific kind of um, uh, copper winding uh, uh, electromagnet based on a particular kind of mathematics developed by this guy by the name of Marco Roden. Anyway, they're into their second and third generations now. It makes a, a very intriguing electromagnet and the electromagnetic properties that uh, it demonstrates uh, have led uh, myself and to make a number of conclusions that I think are supportable at this stage and appear to suggest that some of our understanding of things like magnetism is entirely wrong. And because of that wrong understanding, we've been pursuing directions with it that uh, A, we miss marvelous opportunities to, to use it to our advantage, and B, the way we're using it is actually kind of destructive to both the, uh, the um, local environment and the uh, greater environment as a whole because we're wasting all kinds of material doing things we needn't bother. Uh, so, some of the things that we've got here, okay, uh, one last thing on, a, on the new uh, property is that we will be, have the opportunity there to set up the webcams, uh, oh, I think maybe I mentioned that, uh, as well as the uh, experiment uh, views. Okay, so the new electrics um, and the uh, rodent coils here for the uh, shift into the, uh, probably the fourth generation of them, maybe, uh, we'll see... Uh, uh, some of the magnetic effects, uh, at least according to my reading of what the new electrics is going to provide us, we'll see some of the magnetic effects start to create um, uh, dangerous uh, magnetic field anomalies. So people that are experimenting with rodent coils should be aware that while we're safe at the moment, messing about as we are with usually 12 volts, uh, 24 volts, uh, but a DC current, and so on, and these oscillations. Some of the more, uh, some of the other experiments that we're now progressing to are, are actually creating dangerous circuits, and, that, and I also think we're going to have to start becoming aware of magnetism as a potentially dangerous force. So now we're going to uh, segue right into the um, uh, quick little bit, uh, hopefully here, uh, of a science discovery session on magnetism. And I was going to have a, the whiteboard up and draw you the old uh, view of magnetic lines and so on, but you can Google it. If you just go like magnetic lines in, in Google, you'll get this picture of the magnet and the lines coming out and magnetic lines of force. And the, and the problem is that that's actually not what's occurring. And the reason that that's not what's occurring is that you can't show the, the uh, magnetic lines of force by throwing uh, iron uh, filings in there because they become magnetized themselves. And so they're just simply suspended in a magnetic field, but they're not actually demonstrating where or what that magnetic field is or what it even looks like. Um, what does do it, though, is this stuff called uh, ferrofluid. Uh, and I've got some here, and it demonstrates a number of really cool things with magnets, which we're just going to go into one at the moment, and then a couple of ancillary uh, or corollary uh, propositions that come along with it. So here's this little tube of uh, ferrofluid, which is a, a two different fluids, one in suspension of the other, sort of like a lava lamp. And we have a, uh, a blob on the bottom, this darkish blob that's sort of blue, I'm trying to get as much color as I can. And this is actually a uh, magnetically sensitive material. And so when I bring a, I'm going to bring a, um, a series of four uh, neodymium magnets up to it and create the effect. And you'll see what a magnetic field actually looks like. And so I'm bringing those up now. And you can see the magnetic field rising from the material. And as you look, I'm going to try and get it so that it's focused there to the camera. You'll see that it becomes very much like a sea anemone or um, sea urchin, or the inner, inner uh, part of a uh, sunflower, something like that. Actually, mathematically, it's very similar to the arrangement you see of seeds in a sunflower. Uh, very much this little spiky critter. Uh, let's see if that view is any better. There we go. I'm going to twist it around. So this is our little point of discovery. And you can see that this is the... Uh, the field end, this is the end of the magnetic field that these magnets generate. And it's so such that I can let it go and it'll stay there. And we create the magnet. It falls over on its side here when I tip it up because it's not strong enough to hold it. There is some repulsion. And it holds it in shape and so on. 
And, it, and it's really cool. Kathy saw this for the first time and said, well, you should, <laughs> she said, I said, you should make an um, executive toy out of it. Uh, but, but my point is, we use the ferrofluid as a, um, a test tool. And you can use these in test tools with uh, the rodent coils, and you find something that's really cool with those. But I don't have the time to go into that at the moment. I want to keep these discovery videos very short and concentrate on one point. The one point I want to get across today is that our definitions of magnetic fields are totally wrong. Not only are they not these um, uh, worlds of, uh, of, as we've seen with the iron filings, magnetic fields are alive. Permanent magnets here are creating these uh, spikes. The spikes that you're seeing here are the inside of little tornadoes, the inside of little vortices that are whirling out. So you're seeing the, the little spiky end is the point of the inside of a tornado. So it's kind of like an upside down tornado. So let's do it this direction. So see, those are like, like tornadoes uh, whirling down from uh, uh, the, the sky here. And there we go. And so those are little vortexes that are causing that effect. And you're seeing that outlined on from the inside, and you don't see it on the outside. Now, what you can't see probably, what's not visible through the camera, is that that uh, vortice is just sitting here. Each one of these little spikes is sitting there whirling. The material that here is in here in the ferrofluid is actually moving. If you put this into a... A, uh, under a microscope and look at it, you'll see it actually sit there and slowly rotate. Different kinds of magnets give it a different range of rotation and so on. So number one, magnetic fields are not static. They're constantly pouring out um, uh, energy. That energy is dissipating itself and in, into our natural environment in the form of these vortices that we're seeing as a result of this permanent magnet creating a, a rift, if you will, a continuous rift into the ether field uh, that is not acknowledged by regular science or dark matter or whatever the hell they want to call it. They can't describe magnetism adequately, so so uh, basically to hell with them. They've got no rights to bitch. I mean, academia. Now, what I'm doing here is causing a very particular kind of a magnetic field in which the inside of that field is dimpled. You can't really see it through the bottom here. You can really only observe it I think downward, but there's there's a two rows of spikes that are being created because I'm able to manipulate the field by what I'm doing with the magnets out of sight. And that is to, to say cause minute separations between them, which I can't actually demonstrate because I'm holding this. And these are really strong magnets. These are uh, N50s, I think. I'll have to double check that. But in any event, the point I want to get across is something that is here uh, that is uh, uh, readily apparent to us anyway, to myself at uh, in observing this is that we can now formulate new magnetic laws. It is not a case of magnetism losing its uh, power, so to speak, proportionally to the distance, to the square of the distance. That's not true. What's actually occurring is that the intensity of the field is shortening uh, with the reduction of the distance and splitting. But the amount of energy, the overall energy required to move that mass of material there stays the same. It's that the shape of the uh, energy is being demonstrated changes, but the amount of energy involved is still there in spite of the fact that I've, I've increased the distance. So the square of the distance stuff for magnetism is BS. We have to look at it entirely from a physics viewpoint from an entirely different uh, view. What's actually going on is it's still moving that mass. It's just not moving it in the same uh, form nor in the same localized form of energy of, of energetic propulsion as it does when it's when it's uh, at this stage within the field. So we're looking at a field process here, and there is a point at which that material is in the field. There, yeah, there begins in the field, and a point when it's not. So the uh, and once it's within the field, I'm able to maneuver it and change the entire mass regardless of the uh, the distance uh, from the uh, from the mass so uh, the reduction of the strength of the field by uh, uh, proportion to the square of the distance is is to a certain extent functional rule of thumb sort of makes sense and you can make it work but it's not really an adequate description of what's going on uh, relative to these now other things you can determine too is the uh, the distance of the, um, or the, these, we could actually get in here, and I can probably do this through software, and that is to measure the uh, spikes here 
as we pull away and get a, um, a true and accurate description of the of the field at various different points all along it as we slowly pull away and, and describe it. So it'd be very much like uh, putting your hand in an x-ray machine that was very narrow and having to pull it through very slowly and get a view section by section. Uh, one of the MRIs, well, magnetic resonance machines. And uh, to be able to do that and then get a full description of the field all the way around it. But the key component is, again, Something to note. Uh, I don't know if we can really show it here, but if you put this stuff under a binocular uh, microscope and look at it with even uh, 10 magnification, and I've got a got one I can put on to to uh, video, but it's 200 magnification, so we'll have to see if it does us any good. But if you do that, you can actually observe the particles continue to swirl around as the magnet makes contact here, dissipating its energy, its potential in universe, into this material, which is just actually showing us the vortices that exist, whether the material is there or not. So our description of magnetic fields, our understanding of them is totally wrong, <laughs> which is probably why we don't do a whole lot of things with electricity very well. And uh, the British, not at all. <laughs> uh, especially in cars. Anyway, so... so um, uh, so now we're going to get a whole new understanding of uh, magnetism and uh, field theory, uh, field effect, and how to, to uh, achieve it and, and muck about with it. And in doing so, we're going to end up with uh, devising uh, dozens of new kinds of test tools. We're seeing them come out already. Uh, these things are, um, th some of the new test tools are quite interesting. Uh, you can see some of the effects you can get with the multiple magnetic field sources, it causes a, a more uh, of a distortion, but at the same time produces a, a greater or grander view of what's going on up close. Anyway, um, something to really think about and something to play around with. Some of the effects that we can get here are uh, suggestive of some real interesting vortex uh, potential, which basically would come down to perpetual motion or free energy because whatever it is is leaking out of uh, our material here. I can show a, the green um, uh, magnetic film and show the white line there and show the etheric uh, boundary or the dielectric boundary, but uh, we'll get into that another another video as we, <laughs> we get into some of the other discoveries. Uh, but my point of, or, uh, uh, purpose at this point is to start codifying uh, some of the effects we're seeing with uh, magnetism. Now, uh, you ought to see what we're able to do with the um, uh, material here as a sensor and rodent coils, which I can't show you at the moment because, or at all really, because of where it's located uh, on the property that we're currently at. Uh, but we're, I've been able to determine that rodent coils are um, beyond being simply uh, phenomenal as uh, permanent monopoles, magnetic monopoles, which should not exist. They should not exist, and yet they do. And uh, if you've got the um, uh, ferrofluid uh, in there, in the um, uh, field effect, or in the, the field created by the uh, rodent coil, uh, you can find out that A, it's elliptical, so it's, it's uh, something quite interesting as a monopole, and then uh, B, it has a, has a huge level of agitation. So getting the ferrofluid in, in uh, the rodent coil causes it to spin up like you wouldn't believe, uh, much more so than the permanent magnets. And uh, even to be able to be stabilized to where we can do some direct measurements uh, on the, the, the exposed vortices, the inside exposed vortices, telling us how big the actual the vortex is that's causing the, uh, the inner part of it to be revealed. So anyway, quite fascinating. I'll let everybody go. It's probably way too long anyway. Um, uh, there'll be more of these as we, we get into this. We're doing all of our stuff open source, uh, basically for bragging rights and to share it around. It keeps us all safe. Uh, if, you're really, if you're interested in the new electrics and the maker community and that kind of thing, start looking at rodent coils and just let it, let it uh, take you around and just look at some of the things. Uh, they also call them uh, second generation. It's called um, uh, Starship Coils. Again, highly, very powerful, very interesting devices. Uh, more later.